Kia ora kato, no mai haere mai. Greetings and welcome to this month's EHF live session. Edmund Hillary Fellowship is a collective of entrepreneurs, scientists, storytellers, creatives and investor change makers who want to make an impact globally from Aotearoa New Zealand. This session, it's the last of a series where you're going to hear from Scott Cabot, an EHF fellow who is an experienced operating executive and entrepreneur with a track record of building customer friendly mainstream brands to compete in historically unfriendly categories. His experience includes subscription businesses, marketplaces, healthcare, Internet of Things, and consumer packaged goods. Now, this session is on customer acquisition, and Scott's going to share his insights on what to focus on and what to avoid. Um, last month, if you came or if you missed it, it was on building a marketing team, and Scott shared his insights on when, who, how, and where things can go wrong. You can see all those recordings on our website. I'll pop it into the chat afterwards. Um, there'll be plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, this is a 45-minute session. Uh, and don't forget, these sessions are informal. They're planned in a way that when you leave here after the 45 minutes, you feel you know Scott enough on a personal level that you can connect with him via his uh, consulting firm and you know what he's intending for New Zealand and you can just connect directly. So, yeah, so as I said, we'll be recorded. Um, and feel free to unmute if you have any questions or just put them into the chat and we can read them out for you. Over to you, Scott. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, great to be with everyone. I uh, Sometimes when we have these groups, we have a big crowd, sometimes we have smaller. In a way, I think one, one of the great things about this format is um, it's small enough that we can make it interactive. I really want to hear from you guys and what questions you have. Um, I have a few pages. I, um, have you know some update just overview of some trends and some things to think about but i certainly don't want to be talking at you so please jump in with with uh, questions or feedback along the way uh and we will you know so we can have q a throughout um wh whatever works best for you guys let me just share my screen real quick there we go okay is everybody seeing that Fantastic. Okay, so this is, um, you know, we've done four different workshops, one on go to market, one on brand, one on marketing organization. This is one that um, this particular one is is obviously, uh, it's a question we come across a lot with early stage startups, because it's not at all uncommon to have a team that focus first on building an MVP product and then getting to the point of thinking around, well, how do we start to attract more customers, but do that in a financially responsible way? So um, in our business, we encounter this a lot in our uh, consulting, our marketing advisory work. So I'll, I'll do just very quick background on myself, talk about some trends, some tips and tricks. We have Q&A at the end, but also along the way. So you know, we, we don't have to save your questions. Um, just briefly, um, I, I think some of you have seen this before in these earlier workshops, but just quick background. I grew up in management consulting and consumer packaged goods, um, long history through tech, hardware, software, and healthcare, always with this repeatable act of, as Michelle said, you know, building emergent brands, but also coupling that with scalable revenue engines. Um, and then today, I, so I live in the Bay Area. I founded a 621 Consulting, which is a consulting firm of 200 plus fractional marketers. They're all experienced marketing operators from CMOs to demand gen brand content people who will plug in to startups or private equity backed businesses to help them build marketing capabilities. So that's all you're gonna hear about me. Let's. Um, Let's talk a little bit just before we dive in about some general just rules of thumb for thinking about this. Um, one is that, and, and this comes up in a lot of these uh, workshops, that um, it's not uncommon to think, well, that applies to B2B, but I'm B2C or vice versa. Um, you'll see a mix in here of some things that feel a little more B2B oriented. Some are a little more B2C oriented, I will say my general bias, and I recently wrote a blog post on this that you can see on our website. I, I think that people tend to overstate the differences between them. Whereas there are, from a marketing perspective, um, there are a number of areas where your approach would be similar and the fundamentals remain similar, even if your route to market's a little different. So let's not get too hung up on one versus the other, but if you have questions along the way, let me know. Um, 
One thing you'll hear from me a lot is this idea of starting narrow. I think this is a, a common temptation in startups when you, you start a company because you have a dream of ubiquity, right? Everyone in the world will use our product or service. And I think that's wonderful. And you know, may we all have that good fortune. Um, I just want to remind us though, that a lot of times where the danger a startup can run into is starting by watering everything down for everybody. And I just really encourage you to focus in on a couple of core customer segments out of the gate. Um, and then finally, and we'll talk more about this later, um, a, a frequent challenge that startups run into is they get so singularly focused on acquisition that they lose sight of what's happening from a customer per, uh, retention standpoint. So, you know, you're pouring a bunch of investment in new customers in the top of the funnel and a bunch of them are leaking out and you're doing it again, again, and again, only it gets more and more expensive. So just know that when, when I talk about customer acquisition, I think not just about getting that initial purchase, but how do we get them to stay with us and what do we need to do to, to enable a high intensity of active engaged customers. Let me just check, we had some, did we have a question in the chat? Oh no, there we go, okay. Um, so I'm gonna keep going. Um, just some high level trends and th these few pages admittedly are a little dense. I will say, to be honest, we were doing a presentation on digital marketing for a private equity firm um, to educate their companies. We work with a lot of them on digital enablement. And I, I pulled a few of these because I thought they'd be relevant to this discussion. Not all acquisition is digital, but I think it's incredibly important to understand what's going on there and how that influences your marketing, your early customer acquisition efforts. So one is, this is what we, we all know this in our guts, but I think it's helpful to see it on paper. You look just over this five-year period at how people are spending more and more time in digital media, right? Um, and there's this inclination to think, well, it's just like everyone's streaming streaming different, you know, services with the favorite shows they're binging on. But the reality is it, um, it is really across the board. And even in a B2B context, um, people are using digital channels to research companies, to look at content, to look at re reviews, et cetera, et cetera. And then what you see this translated into when it comes to advertising, and which is not to say that all customer acquisition is advertising, but it always helps to know where the dollars are going. So you see ad, ad dollars shifting in a very similar way, right? It used to be that um, you, know, you wanted to launch a product, you paid for a TV campaign and some billboards and some you know, uh, ads in your newspaper and there you'd launched your product. And now you can see that over two thirds of media spend is digital and that trend, there's nothing in that number, trend that tells me it won't continue, the dark line won't continue to grow at the expense of the light line. Anything in here surprising to anyone? Yeah, I imagine this is, these are, these are things we hear a lot as startup folks. Um, this is a little dense, but bear with me. This is a, um, this will feel a little more B2B oriented, but you know, we can, we can talk about uh, what elements, if any, are truly B2B. I think generally you can be relevant across the board. So look, um, one of the things that happened with partially due to COVID, but partially due for other reasons is it's challenging to scale in an offline environment. Like if you were relying on trade shows and, and conferences and, and, and having a table at a, at a show as a way to build awareness, you just have fewer opportunities to do that. It's time consuming, it's expensive. That's not to say you should not seek to do that, but a digitally enabled funnel is critically important. I mean, I've yet to see a business that did not need that to underpin a component of its customer acquisition plan. Second, and, and this is a, it's a, look, an exciting time. There's just a lot of technology that can support your acquisition efforts, right? You've got you know, a wide range of platforms for advertising, for web, for customer engagement. Um, one watch out here is sometimes I see organizations say, well, hey, we invested in all the technology, we're done. Just flip the switch and it's gonna work. It doesn't work that way. You actually have to have you know, process and good um, you know, experiments in place to, to fully leverage the tech that you build. But there's a lot that's right off the shelf 
you can use without having to overinvest in infrastructure. Um, next, I think this is incredibly important. Um, no one, whether they're a consumer or a buyer in a business, wants to feel like they're being advertised to, right? It just, we have a, there's a lot of psychology and behavioral economics of sure we just have a reflexive reaction to look skeptically at all that. So the more we are able to customize the outreach where it feels like, hey, this person is talking to me, they empathize, they understand me. And this is one of the things, if any of you were at the workshop we did on branding, we talked about the importance of leading with empathy. Before you sell anything, you want a, a prospect to look and say, these guys get me, they understand my pain points. So there's a lot of great technology that enables you to do this in a targeted way. And it, it's very disarming. It's a, it's a way to get people into your funnel where they feel like, hey, this company is talking to me specifically. Um, this is like, this could be a conversation in and of itself, but I, I think it's incredibly important to look holistically at your customer journey, um, to look at, you know, where are you losing people? Where is it breaking? Do we need tech? Like, let's make sure we have good um, analytics across the board to see where people are traveling through our funnel. Like in a B2B world, like, how are we doing getting from awareness to marketing qualified lead to sales qualified lead or in a consumer world, like how are we doing it converting site traffic to commerce, et cetera. And then the last thing, which sort of ties to the first is, um, you know, the, I don't think this will surprise any of you that the sales teams that are truly digitally enabled and they're using HubSpot, they're using Salesforce, they're figuring out how to do, you know, targeted ABM campaigns, for instance, are just running out ahead of the teams that aren't doing that. Um, that's sort of the, the, the so what of all this digital enablement. Any questions, reactions, or should I keep going? Just on that one, uh, I do have one. Yeah. So, because most companies that are going in for those types of technology are obviously just that little bit more further forward. They're probably on that growth trajectory because not everyone can afford that straight mm -hmm. off as a startup. So what do you think should be the first kind of steps in a startup should do with having someone of that um, that technology or analyzing? Um, it, it, it's a good question, Michelle. And I'll, I'll talk in a minute about some of the basics on Google and Facebook. But generally speaking, I think you know there's a lot of off the shelf um, tools direct through Google that are very self-serve, easy to use. I think where the question you raise comes up a lot when it comes to CRM right? And it is really tempting to say, hey, we're going to do a whole RFP. We're going to look at these, you know, automation platforms, Mar you know, Marketo, uh, Salesforce, et cetera, et cetera. What I do see a lot of companies start with is like, hey, let's just do some, let's get up in HubSpot with some basic fundamentals and we might outgrow it or we might need to bolt other tools onto it. But I also, I generally think that's a good way to start. And you can do a lot there in terms of defining audiences, triggered campaigns, um, segmentation, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and, and they have some good turnkey solutions. It's not perfect. It doesn't necessarily scale, but oftentimes that's a, a shorter hill to climb than to say, hey, we're gonna do a, a full Salesforce implementation and, you know, or Eloqua or something like that. and. Um, you will eventually reach that point, but you may not need it that early. It's a good question. So just in, in terms of the funnel, um, you know, I, I always think it's really important to think about, and while like we all look at this and nod, nod our heads, a lot of times where I see marketing teams get confused is uh, in forgetting in a you know, particular marketing channel or a piece of creative, forgetting situationally what part of the funnel it's supposed to influence, right? Like just to step through this top of the funnel, this isn't really about converting people and educating them on all the features and benefits of what we offer. It's really about just like hooking them, right? Like when you see a billboard and out of home ad, it's really meant to just get someone to go look at your website and learn more, right? Now, when they're at the website, like how are we educating them? Are we explaining what we do and why it's unique uh, and why they should consider purchasing it? And then we move people down the funnel, right? Eventually like, we wanna convert them and close the sale 
or you know retention we want to hold on to them and upsell them i didn't get deep into advocacy here not because it isn't important just but more because it, it's less of a front end question on acquisition so i do think it's important when you think about doing it a holistic integrated marketing campaign to think about which marketing channels are playing at which levels of the funnel here right it is very common and we'll talk about this more in a minute it's very common to really zero in on that consideration and conversion phase which makes a ton of sense and you should um and yet that won't do the work of of educating people and, and putting them into the top of the funnel so you need to supplement um that mid funnel work with some top of funnel activity um, and then I, I'm almost, I just have a couple more pages and then we'll, we'll open this up. Um, in terms of getting started, just uh, I want to talk about a few guiding principles. Uh, you know, I talked earlier about this idea of going narrow. Um, let's talk about that a little more. I think uh, when it comes to, you know, building customer satisfaction, but also raising funding from VCs, investors, I, I'm strongly predisposed to say, look, it's better to have great um, love of the product and service and great unit economics on a small scale than it is to have a bunch of people who like you on a, on a large scale, but don't love you, right? So, you know, as I mentioned, like, don't, don't be afraid to hone in because I think what that will do is it'll really discipline your team to build all the habits and practices around go-to-market and acquisition. You can oil the engine, the risk of failure is not as great if you're not doing it on a large scale. And you will learn inevitably, you know, every company I see that wants to go broad too quickly tends to underestimate how many assumptions they're making that they haven't yet proven out, right? And so you've got, there may be things that you think are hard facts that in the eyes of your customer may just be a, a, a misplaced hypothesis. So I just encourage you to go narrow and test and iterate, which was the second point. And then this last one I just touched on, um, it is, it's very tempting and particularly like if you do research and, and ask people how interested they are in your product to, to look at like, well, hey, a bunch of people said they might be interested. Well, I'd rather see particularly for an early stage business without a lot of brand awareness or without a big community of established users to evangelize for you. It's always better to have a hundred people who love you than a thousand who like you, right? Because those hundred will be people who you use to validate assumptions and test and iterate and help you learn. They'll also become fierce advocates for you and you'll use them and testimonials and case studies, which is another really important way to disarm people in your, in your um, acquisition efforts. And, you know, I, I started, I went through Y Combinator about a decade ago um, and with an ed tech startup. And this was one of the things they really pounded into our heads was spend time with a handful of customers who, and make sure they love everything you're doing, even if it's not scalable. And then you'll learn from them how to do this at scale in an automated way. Uh, and then I think this is my last page, actually, and you know, I'll, I'll stop droning on. So just, uh, uh, oh, actually, sorry, two more. So this was in, back in reference to Michelle's question about, what, you know, where do you start? So SEO, my general view on SEO is that it's table stakes, right? Like this is, um, you, when you launch a business, you are out talking to friends and family or your early customers are talking to people and the industry or their friends and family, anytime someone hears about you and wants to learn more, they're gonna go searching for you. They might get your, your company name exactly right. They might misspell it. They might search for something that sounds like your name, but you know, it's like, well, what was the name of that company that offers workflow management software? Um, what's happening there is you, one way or another, you have generated top of funnel interest and you're leaving money on the table if you don't capture that, right? And so SEO to me is always a smart hygiene investment that's simply a matter, of, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's not creating awareness, but it's making sure you're harvesting the awareness that's already out there. So I highly recommend that and, and making sure you're, you're tending to it in a disciplined way. Um, Google Ads to me, you know, like I, I, I think it's a really important 
acquisition can be a very efficient acquisition vehicle. You know, a lot of us, if you're like me, the honest answer is when I look at Google results, I rarely click on the paid ones. I go down to the organic ones, which is more SEO. But I do think it's both Google and Facebook offer very flexible ways for very low cost to test. You test a different audience, you test a different message, a different campaign. Um, and those learnings will apply not just for those channels, but you can use it across the board. Like Facebook has some, or sorry, Meta has some really great sophisticated ways to micro target audiences. And then you see like, again, back to the point about making assumptions like, hey, lo and behold, this message resonated more with these people than these people. Well, how can we learn from that and use it elsewhere? And then, you know, both of these tools operate on these auction exchanges where you can, you can, you know, iterate like whatever budget you're putting against advertising is really just theoretical because if something's not working, you're not going to throw money at it for weeks and months at a time. You'll know quickly if, if it's worth pursuing. So I think those are smart, you know, look, at the end of the day, as a general rule of thumb, and this usually doesn't happen early in the life of a company, but you generally want to get to the point where your paid acquisition is no more than about 20% of the people of new customers coming in. Like I can tell you that what a venture investor will worry about if they'll say, hey, you're showing me this great user growth, but it looks like you're just buying all these people through paid ads. That's a big watch out. But I think early on, it's A, it's a really smart way to test and B, it, it will always be, if you do it well and with discipline and you know every day you're smart, your team is smarter than the day before, then it's always a way you can acquire people at a pretty efficient cost if you do it well. And then yeah, just a few guiding principles I wanted to close with. Um, and this is actually a, a good segue from what we were just talking about. Um, you know, in, in, in personal finance, any good financial advisor would say you should diversify your portfolio, right? Don't put it all in, you know, Apple stock or certainly like anyone anyway, put it all in Peloton stock a couple of years ago. I was wishing they didn't, right? Um, and I think the same way about your marketing investments, like when you're like on Facebook, for instance, what I will see a lot is the team will try a bunch of different things they'll find like, hey, we have these four campaigns that didn't work, but this one, holy smoke, it's so efficient. Well, that's great. They should continue to invest in that, but you always need to have a portion of your budget that's testing and looking around for the next thing because the, the, the tactics that are working will eventually hit wear out and diminishing returns. And you don't wanna to have to then start to discover what the next thing is at that point. So it's smart to say, look, of our, budget will put, you know, 70 per 80% of it against high performing marketing activities, but the other 20 to 30%, we're going to put against experimenting in the hopes of finding what our future, um, you know, efficient levers will be. And that's back to this point. Look, I, I think it's just incredibly important to always be testing and building on those learnings. Um, it's, it's incredibly important that the team feel like, hey, it's okay to take a risk, it's okay to fail, right? I used to always say when I was a CMO that if like when my team would send out, we were always updating our conversion funnel, my team would send out updates. When I saw, I was almost happier getting an update about something that didn't work than something that did because it told me, hey, we got a lot smarter today and we know not what not to do next week, right? So I just think promoting that and encouraging that, and that's back to the diversified portfolio idea. I think that's important. The other thing is, and it sounds so simple, but you'd be surprised how many times this goes wrong. Um, it is easy to just say, hey, we're testing. We're always testing. It's great. And then you get to the end of the test and you are locked in a room having a Zoom conversation, having a debate about whether the test was successful, right? And it's hard to stay objective once you're invested in something that you put your name on and put out in the marketplace. So I think it's really smart to have the conversation in advance about what does success look like here? If it goes great, what do we, what do we think we'll do with that? If it goes poorly, what will we do with that? But have that conversation while you can still be objective. Um, and then, you know, on a related note, 
It is, and, and this is less of an issue in, in small, small teams, but as more people come in, it, it always surprises me how little communication there is about what we learned, right? Like if you, there's Facebook and Google ads, we're talking about how great of a lab they are to go get insights. Um, it's only valuable if everyone else in the company knows about it, right? Because these learnings aren't relevant just to your advertising. They're relevant to everything you do in marketing, everything you do in product, everything you do in customer success. So I would just make sure that there's good hygiene on socializing, not just the results, but what they mean and what we should do as a result. Um, you know, I, I touched on this earlier. Uh, it is, you know, back to this point about not being completely overweighted on paid marketing. Um, you know, the SEO and the Google ads and Facebook ads, a lot of what we're talking about is really about the mid funnel. Um, and where I do see startups get tripped up is they'll become heavily reliant on those and they forget that they need to build awareness and build an or, you know, organic momentum and word of mouth. And, you know, the problem with that is that you don't just flip that on overnight. Like a good content strategy, for instance, is a long tail into building your brand or, you know, referral program, word of mouth program. Those things take time. And you know, there will come a point where you'll start to see diminishing returns on some of your paid marketing. So when that point comes, you want to, you, part of the way you hedge that risk is because you started building an organic machine a year ago. Right, and that took time, but that that will reap dividends over time, and and that's again why, back to the conversation we had, you know, a couple months ago in branding, like having your brand well defined in advance is really critical there. Um, I think this is my last. Is this my last point? Uh, you know, we talked about the leaky bucket, and um, investors like to look at the relationship between acquisition costs and long term value, CAC to LTV right? Long-term value hinges very much on retention rates. Retention rates are a real lag indicator of how much are people using what you're selling, right? Um, you see this a lot in the SaaS world where, you know, if you, if you sell a subscription to, you know, Spotify, for instance, and someone isn't listening to Spotify enough, when they come up for renewal, they're going to say, well, that's not worth it. I should cancel it, right? So the best the best way to impact retention and LTV on a day-to-day -day basis is to focus on how do we get people to use our product or service as much as possible. And this ties back to the point about personalized messaging. You know, this is where you, the teams who do this best are able to, to reach out to their existing customers and say, hey, we noticed the, that you use our product in the following ways. Here's some other features you might not be aware of that can help you with what we see you're already doing. Or, you know, you said when you registered that you work in sales, here are three tools we have for salespeople. Whereas, hey, you know, this is HR person over here, here's something for HR people. So keep in mind that one, those high retention helps offset the cost of acquiring people. And it also contributes to advocacy and virality. If you have people using your product or service regularly, they'll talk about it. That word of mouth fills the top of the funnel and drives down your acquisition costs. That's the basics of startup unit economics. Okay, I'm done talking. What can I answer? Thank you for listening. No, that was awesome, Scott. How about we unshare this? that way so then people oh, can yeah, see yeah. you yeah 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 great. perfect does anyone have any questions or any reflections that they want to um add in maybe stuff that's happening in their own business yeah i i was just going to share um in the chat i'll share we're just launching our online shop for a, a brand new product next uh next week and since we've been on this call i've um received news that our product after it's like two months late just just 15 minutes ago i got the um word that it's been manufactured so we're about to do oh, things scott so it's a it's a health product it's backed by science and technology and doctors we've packaged it ourselves 
Um, oh, our young founder, she's 25. She's um, been in marketing and I'm really encouraged by what you say because she's the expert on this and she's been leading us. And I really think, man, she's all That's over great. it. We've oh, had this a, looks um, cool. I'm looking at it. We've had... Um, well, there's going to be a better banner. That's the last thing to get changed before it goes live. This is the draft. Um, but uh, yeah, we've got videos on there and um, yeah, she, we've done a lot of research and found these, we were getting these made in the US and then sold through a 3PL in California. Mm -hmm. um, and that should, our first sales should be exactly this time next week, Friday morning, New Zealand time. Oh, it's exciting. That's um, exciting. Congratulations. And what, how we've been looking at customer, how she's been running a program of customer acquisition is we've had a really good Instagram um, and meta run. We've got um, a lot of, we've got thousands of followers on Instagram. We've got a lot of content we've been doing for six months all about gut health. And um, we did a pre-order for these products. And unfortunately, this our first run is only 500 of each. And we've got 500 emails um, for pre-ordering these. And how we are doing our, our the customer acquisition is our biggest thing at the moment, of course. So first of all, we've got the pre-sales, we've got the the emails that have been generated through the through the awareness raising and our learn on the site, our information on the site, medical information. Okay. Um, but <coughs> also, um, we're running an affiliate program and a refer cool. a refer a friend discount. Um, okay. And, and so and the first sales come with a card and that's got a scannable code to refer a friend each get $20 off and um, yeah we've got a Clavio installation for uh, good for um, emailing people you know it's on its way what to expect because if you're actually ill with SIBO small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and that's thought to be 70% of IBS um, then these products will make you feel worse before you get better. So that's something we really need to engage with. We've got it. We've got it in our mm. marketing there, but not hugely. But between them buying and them taking it, we need to tell them to expect that. So, yeah, that's the point we're at. And um, any feedback? We're as I say, this, this shop will go live um, this yeah. time next week. Um, we've got a th uh, them being made in Utah and then shipped to California. Okay. Yeah, I, I would thank you. I mean, it sounds like you guys have been very thorough. I think that's near, you know, having having lived in the healthcare world and the CPG world, and I, I relate to a lot of this. And we advise some companies who who are in that similar world. I, I one thing I will say is, and this is kind of part customer acquisition, part wearing my brand hat. That um, in the uh, when it comes to your health, right, like the ingesting or buying something that's a brand that, that you're not familiar with that's new and unproven is always a little scary right and i think there are really two ways that you break through that barrier one is um use testimonials and stories of real people who say hey i use this and it really helped me right like when you're talking about ibs i think there's a great opportunity for people to be able to say look i, I was having a lot of symptoms you know i use fixed biome and it, it was magical um, and showcasing those people, I think, is is, is really important. Um, and then the, what UGC, was the other thing? UGC, as uh, the Jasmine says, UGC. So they use the yes. content. So we yes. know, really, um, really, yeah, looking for that. And then and lining people. Yeah, up. and then the, I think that's smart. And then the one other thing I was going to say is some kind of um, validation from the medical community. You don't need them to sell your product, but to have, you know quote for some doctors or medical association saying, you know, hey, I, this is this is founded on great research. I know this team, you know, it, it helps um, helps break through the barriers. Yeah, so our, our co-founder is, uh, two co-founders are doctors um, and um, gastro published doctors and the, the system that it's based off is, it's a tweak of another system that has evidence that it's as efficacious as antibiotics for the, for the um, for quite serious and expensive antibiotics for the for SIBO, um, so uh, um, yeah, it's it's um, we've got a pretty good scientific base. But yeah, and the next thing is we want to get um, published and get some backlinks and get these affiliates signed up. And but yeah, we've only just got products in the last fifteen minutes, so it's been a long, long journey to get to it. So yeah, very that's exciting. great. Congratulations. Let me know how it goes. Yeah. Other questions. 
Um, I have a question here, uh, Scott. Uh -huh. um, so um, I'm a little bit more focused on what not to do in marketing uh, since um, okay. I'm, I'm one person company. I'm running um, a company that produces uh, date spread. Um, right. So I'm quite in a few supermarkets, including New World. Uh, but I struggle with my marketing. I don't have marketing background and I do it all myself. And for me, uh, that would be really helpful to hear what not to do because I'm attending all these workshops and they talk what to do. Yes, fine. I understand I need to do this yeah. and that. But what are the mistakes? Uh, like you said, one of the common mistakes uh, for startups is to go broad. Uh, that's fine. That's a lesson for me. Right. I need to go narrow. What else? What are some other things to keep in mind and not to do? Yeah, I, I would say in general, I would resist the urge to try to do too many things at once and also to over invest in marketing. I mean, look, if you're going to need some resources to help you with some of the execution and you can do that with, you know, you can find some contract, like a contractor to do Google ads and SEO, for instance, that kind of thing. But um, I would focus on, you know, get get the kind of the, the middle of the digital funnel enabled well. Like, do we know how to reach out to people? Do we know how to try to convert them? And maybe you hold off on the top of the funnel awareness building because that's that's just more work and less measurable. But I, I think that you know, as I mentioned, like SEO, as I have this notion that it's just like table stakes. Like you'd be you'd be making a mistake not to get at least the basics in place. And I, I think that's probably a, a smart place to start because I also think the, as I mentioned earlier, the learning you'll get from, you know, even just a very modest investment on Google or Facebook will, will help you think about where you want to go next. And I think that's smart before you, you know, before you over invest. Like, we, when you're really small, you want to avoid spending a lot of money in marketing that's not against a high return. There will come a time where you have to be willing to do some things that are lower ROI, but that feels a little premature. I might also think if you think you're ready for this, think about finding a resource to help with some basic PR on a contract basis. You don't need to hire a full-time mm -hmm. person for that. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. All right, thank you. Sure, I hope that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Julia, nice to see you again. Julia and I had a, a side chat after our last workshop. Um, anyone else have questions? Scott, I um, was reluctant to come on this call because you're talking about something that I am phenomenally weak on. <laughs> and uh, I have been really encouraged by some of the things you've said around oh, people, people loving you. And, you know, I seriously, I thought, oh, you know, I'll just realize all the stuff I'm really terrible at. And in the team, I'm the last one that should be on the call. However, it's recorded, which is fabulous. Um, okay. And, you know, you talked about, so we are loved by, you know, a small group of people, you know, a couple of hundred people, maybe 300. And as we've grown, so we're a membership base. Okay. And as, as we've grown, all our, our gig is around diversity. And so okay. when we started off, the diversity was this big. And now we cover 70 plus industries and professions. Our wow. youngest member okay. is, is 19. Our oldest has been 74. 52% okay. female, 14% Maori, 10% other, and 76% Pakeha. And, you know, people tell us about beachhead and so forth. And it's just like, how do you get a beachhead when you're dealing with that? And diversity yeah. is our gig. And our process is, is deep personal development. Got it. And it's really hard to go out and talk openly uh, about our work. And so we haven't. And we are also the first of its type in the world and we've had nothing to copy. So we haven't said anything. We've never done any marketing. And we thought as time went on, it would get easier as our membership grew, but it hasn't. 
Mm. And we've done, we've been working hard the last 12, 18 months to really start digging into what we are achieving, getting some metrics, learning what impact we're having and all that sort of stuff. And we are about to emerge hopefully in the next, by the end of the year with a new look and new messaging and so forth. Okay. The, quest, the question is this. So membership base, our average member stays with us for seven years and longest, has been, with us, longest has been with us for 15 years. And and when they when I say stay with us, it's actively involved, but people stay involved indirectly for sure. longer as well. So the testimonial part, mm -hmm. what would you what is the best way for people? Is it written? Is it video? Is it how would you for a, it's a yeah. personal and professional development leadership program? And I don't I like to use leadership and we've never used it because I don't believe in leadership. Okay. Um, but we've been told that we need to use leadership because that's what the market recognizes. Got it. Um, so a couple of quick thoughts. Thank you for the context. Art. That's, that's very helpful. A um, couple of things. First of all, I, uh, you know, in the, there's this notion back to this thing about, about personalized campaigns. There's this notion in the B2B world right now of ABM account-based marketing this idea of like, let's pick out a segment and do an end-to-end, -end, you know, highly customized marketing campaign for them. And, you know, one is, I think that might be understanding of a lot of diversity. Um, I, I think that building out that muscle might be smart. Pick, you know, two segments or three or, or start with one and just build that machinery, understanding that you're not stopping there. You'll reapply that to others. Like, um, Back in my SaaS days with Prezi, it was a presentation software. We we marketed to a lot of different functions and we saw, it was probably more towards sales and marketing, but we saw this niche opportunity with HR professionals. So well, let's get to know them really well and figure out how to build a campaign that serves their needs and we'll we'll work out the kinks and then use that for marketing and sales. I think that's, that's one. Two, to your point in testimonials, um, it does not have to be high tech. Like you literally could ask people just like use your webcam or turn your phone on yourself and answer these three questions in one minute. Um, you can take that video and cut it up. And then you can also create still ads that you can use on Facebook or, on your, or quotes out of that. Like you, all the, the, the verbiage that comes out of those testimonials, you can repurpose. So like, you know, in Hazel's case, like I, I was advising a company in the gut health space and they had this really passionate community of, of type two diabetics who they were trying to reach and had all these videos of people saying, this changed my life, here's why. And so we put, we'd make video ads on Facebook with those, you know, by editing those videos, we'd also do still photos with quotes then we'd have quotes rolling on the website. You can take that content and do an awful lot with it. And I would not worry about thinking, oh, we have to have a professional shoot in the studio. I think in, in many respects, it feels more authentic when it's just really low fidelity in someone's home on their, on their phone. Is that helpful? Yeah, it really is. Great. It really is. Because a big part of what, what we do is about authenticity. And people forget that authenticity often doesn't look that good. That's right. And it, and it, 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 I would keep that in mind. I would keep that in mind. Like a slick, high production value video might actually serve the opposite purpose. Like, oh, it feels like someone's just advertising to me. And, and we get feedback from people when they say, I go along to the Chamber of Commerce and everybody looks flash. And I come along to Collective Intelligence and everybody looks like shit. And, right. you know, we, because we deal with real stuff and real stuff yeah. is not flesh. Yeah. You're dealing with real people and, and yeah, that, that's right. It's real life. That's like, let's not try to shine on it. Um, thank you. No, I love that question. Well, thank you all. I have to have to run to a family yeah. commitment, yeah. unfortunately. But, uh, Brilliant. I, thank I, you. I really enjoyed you all had great questions. Uh, I, I'm, I'm glad you're you're immersing yourself in these uh, topics. And if you have subsequent questions, don't hesitate to here. I'll put my email in the yeah. in the chat and don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, I, this is a it's a topic I hold near and dear to my heart. Um, 
There we go. Perfect. Thanks, Scott. Thank you so much. I enjoyed now, speaking with you. And all I'll leave you. this open so people can um, grab that information off. Thanks, so Michelle. Okay, bye, and everyone. Have a great Scott. day.